Yeah, let's get started. Um, if you wouldn't mind screen sharing, Ryan, I think you have my intro housekeeping slides. I can take care of that and then we can get started. All right. Awesome. All right. Hello, everyone. No problem, Radar. Um, so hello, everyone, to today's webinar. If you're joining us live, we are so excited to have you. And if you are joining us, watching this recording later, we are also so excited to have you joining us from your own time zones. Um, this webinar is brought to you by the Maintenance Community Slack Group. We're a group of over 700 maintenance and reliability professionals. I'm going to add in the chat now, if you're joining us from LinkedIn or you refer here from any other source, um, please feel free to join us there. Um, and so you can hear about live events and get the full recording of this webinar. Next slide, please. A few housekeeping items. So on that red square, you'll see if you hover over your Zoom, there's a chat button. That's where you can submit questions for Ryan, um, answer any questions he might be asking, say hello to the group and find the type form link. Next slide. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Ryan for why we need to bridge the skills gap now. All right, thanks Caitlin for the introduction and thanks everyone for attending as well. Um, today is all gonna be all about why we need to bridge skills gap and we put a in caps lock N-O-W right now. Um, so I've got 64 slides here and we've got 30 minutes and we're gonna make this a, a good session. We'll keep it super interactive and um, I want everyone's comments, feedback, I want it all in the chat. And, and again, we're gonna make this session very, very interactive. I've got 64 slides, so it sounds like we better get started. Um, the, the title of this, again, is why we need to bridge the skills gap right now. I'm gonna first open it up with, you know, one thing that I always say to, to people on our team is that the average person has about five and a half hours of free time in their work days. Um, but you guys are all here. You guys are spending 30 minutes out of your five and a half hours, um, if not less, of your free time here today helping us build this community and do all of this amazing work to push this industry forward to make it a better, make it a better world for the future generations of, of maintenance and reliability. So I'm going to first take three out of my 64 slides and say thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, we've got a, lot, a little bit of an agenda here. I'm going to open it up, tell you guys a little bit about myself, um, my journey in maintenance and reliability, how I came to start and, and found upkeep. Um, the next part of it is really reviewing what the heck the, the skills gap is, why it exists, um, and kind of the things that have led up to this large skills gap over the past you know, decade or so, or maybe even more. Um, the third part here, we're going to review some of the solutions that we've actually sourced the community for answers to. Um, I'm gonna close it up with a few final thoughts and then really open it up for discussion here to everyone who has joined us. So without further ado, my name is Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep. Uh, I started my, my journey as a chemical engineer uh, from UC Berkeley. Uh, my first job out of college actually was working in, a pro working in a manufacturing plant where I was a process engineer. Every single day I was thinking about how do we streamline and make our manufacturing line um, essentially go faster and run faster. That was my entire job as a process engineer there. But what I quickly saw was one, how bad technology was in manufacturing, especially for the maintenance and reliability engineers out there. Um, and two, how much better it could have been if we had better technology. So a little bit about my journey. I started upkeep out of passion and frustration due to the lack of mobility in today's software for maintenance and reliability. And over the past you know, six, seven years, uh, we, we've been trusted by over 10,000 businesses and some of our customers here on this call today. So I'm very, very grateful for all the longtime customers that have been part of this upkeep journey that have seen us grow from you know, very, very small to very, very large. Um, and, and today I would call ourselves a leader in mobile first technology built for the maintenance, reliability engineers of the world. Um, outside of upkeep and outside of just software, a big passion of mine is fostering a community built for the maintenance and reliability leaders of today, fostering a group of 
maintenance and reliabilities that we hope to foster um, next year and the next decade and next generation beyond us. Um, the purpose premise of today is one, not just to talk about the skills gap, why it exists, but also two, to really set in motion a call to action. And the call to action here is addressing and tackling this skills gap that we've been mentioning uh, a few times. So enough about me. What I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the skills gap, what it is, why it exists, how it came to be, and you know, ultimately what we think we're going to do about it. And so like I mentioned here, I've been a part of the maintenance reliability community for roughly about seven years. And over the past seven years, I've noticed a few things. I'm sure everyone here on this call, on this webinar today, can, I'm guessing, uh, agree that the world of maintenance is pretty chaotic and unforgiving. Um, what we've seen from people who work in this space, in this field, the level of skill needed to work in this field is, is, very, is immense. Um, we're talking about multi-million dollar assets, highly complex, inherently dangerous when a maintenance worker goes out and you know, turns wrenches. Um, the level of skill required in, in maintenance and reliability, we believe, and I'm sure all of us believe, is, is immense. Um, but what we've seen and what we've noticed, what we've heard through a lot of our customers, people in the industries, is that there aren't enough qualified workers to fill this void. That's what this skills gap is. And it's a fascinating paradox, especially, you know, when we're in this world of COVID right now and employment is, unemployment is at an all time high. What we're also hearing from people in the community is that there just aren't enough qualified workers. And so this kind of sent us on, and myself and the team here sent, sent us out on this mission to better understand what's going on with this skills gap. And what we've realized is, you know, there's kind of this weird, interesting misalignment between the skills that employers rely on and the skills that job seekers actually have. And so that's, that's the crux of today's conversation. Um, what is the skills gap? How did it, how did it come up and what can we do about it? And so what we talked about already is that COVID-19 has kind of set record levels of unemployment. And, you know, we also have found that you know, our, a lot of our customers today are still struggling to find qualified workers for, for finding and filling these critical positions in their company. And so again, the whole premise behind today is the call to action here. The call to action is, we got to start making progress now. And if we don't, what we believe might happen is that infrastructure could collapse by the next generation, if not in the next decade. I'm going to pause there and basically, uh, you know, rhetorically ask this question, where did the skills gap begin and where is it headed? And so we did a deep dive into trying to answer and uncover this question. We found a study by John Cleese in 2018 where he cited two major forces that perpetuated this skills gap. And he was referring directly into the manufacturing sector. And what I'll do here is dig a little bit deeper and peel back the onion on what those two forces were. The first one is the thing that he coined the silver tsunami. What the silver tsunami meant was essentially the fact that Experienced workers in manufacturing were retiring at a higher rate than new workers are entering the workspace. And what was, what was happening is obviously you've got, you know, X number of people retiring every single year, every single week, every single day. But the folks entering this workforce in manufacturing, especially, you know, aren't getting added at the same rate that people are retiring. The second thing that he pointed out was that manufacturing is actually becoming increasingly more digital. And so while technology is meant to help, it also generates a demand for new skills and different types of skills that didn't exist before. And so when we go back to John Cleese's study, the two big factors here, one is that there's a higher rate of retirement versus people getting added to this workforce into the existing workforce that we have 
um, the types of skills that we need for these roles and for these jobs are actually shifting and changing. And so this is creating, again, what John Cleese is, is stating, this silver tsunami, which is basically, we're gonna see this big impact of this skills gap over the next generation, if not the next decade. So I wanna put this problem into perspective. There's roughly 10,000 people from the manufacturing sector alone that retire every single day. And when 10,000 people retire every single day, that's roughly 40,000 years, collective years of experience that are lost. And these are people's experience throughout their entire time working at a manufacturing plant. These are all the good experiences, all, all the bad experiences. This is all the, the things that we coin and say as tribal knowledge. Um, this is 40,000 years of collective experience being lost every single day. But obviously, you know, we know uh, it's not just about the experience being lost and the collective years being lost. There's also a direct economic impact. When people leave with tons of experience and they retire, there's a direct correlation to economic impact because of the years of knowledge that they've accumulated through being, through being at that plant. So I wanna ask the question to all of you guys, please, please, please type it here in this chat. Um, if we were to try to quantify the skills shortage, how much do you think that will cost the manufacturing sector in the coming decade? And I'll reveal the, the actual answer, let's call it like the, the answer that we found online. Um, but I'm just curious from everyone here, um, what, what do you think the actual economic impact to uh, this skill shortage, if we don't address it, will be? You know, we've got a scary number. We've got 7 billion, 700 billion, over a billion in the US alone. You know, these are all great, great answers. A trillion, yeah. I mean, it, John, it, Joe, it really is up to that level. And so we, we found this study, it was fascinating. Basically what this, said, this study said, and it was, it was conducted in 2018. And so they're looking at the skills shortage over the next decade, starting from 2018. And what they found was that the skills shortage could put roughly $454 billion of manufacturing GDP at risk by 2028 alone. And then, you know, to the seemingly crazy response here to a trillion dollars worldwide, you realize that it actually doesn't look that crazy. It's actually pretty aligned. This persistent skill shortage could risk up to $2.5 trillion in economic output over the next decade. And so when we talk about this skills shortage, it's not just, you know, decades, um, decades of experience leaving the workforce at a higher rate. It's also going to have a direct impact to the, the, every single business's bottom line. And ultimately, the thing that, one of the things that I'm most sad about when I was reading this study by John Cleese is that what's actually happening is that, you know, all the progress that we had, that we had made over the last, you know, 10, 20, 50 years, it's actually stunting, you know, this skill shortage is actually stunting generations of progress that you know all of us here watching this webinar have made over the past few decades and again it's not just that people are retiring it's really that when people are retiring our systems lack the capabilities to effectively capture all of these decades of experience that they've accumulated in their lifetime you know obviously it's it's a known fact that people are going to retire it's a known fact that when people retire we we lose information and knowledge that you know probably should have should have been transferred over but what i want to say here today is that it doesn't have to be that way and we've got technology software systems to help us with that transition as people retire um, that, that knowledge, that tribal knowledge that we always talk about gets effectively migrated to the next person, the next generation that's excited, that wants to push boundaries of our space. 
All right, so I'm done talking about the scary things here in this, here in, in uh, yeah, the world and the cost that it's gonna impact. And I'm seeing a lot of amazing, amazing discussions happening right now from, you know, capturing tribal knowledge is key to uh, making sure that we have repeatable procedures. This is all such good feedback. And again, the purpose of today is really to set, a, set you know, in motion this call to action to do all these great things um, that people are saying, whether it's, you know, making sure to have repeatable procedures, whether it's making sure that we've got better, uh, a better merger from David, uh, a better merger of data and people. And so you guys are beating me to the punchline here, but the next section here is what's the solution? What do we believe the solution is gonna be with, with this skills gap? Um, so you guys have already beat me to, to these questions already, uh, but I would love for everyone to type out here, what solutions do you think people have already come up with? What, do you, what are some of the solutions that you've seen in the industry that people are, are trying to do to address this skills gap? Um, we got a lot of great, great feedback. Uh, you know, type it here out in, in this chat. Um, but but I, I think one thing that I'm hearing from David is essentially that, you know, this skills gap has been talked about for a long, long time, actually. And I'm not surprised. Um, we know that this skills gap exists. We know that, you know, more people are retiring and more people are wanting to join this workforce. But I want to know, what, what are we doing about it? What do you think some other folks are already doing about it? Uh, I love it. Manufacturing, reaching out to community colleges, um, definitely have seen that. Mentoring, apprenticeships, um, SOPs, I love it. These are all really, really good things that we've also noticed too. And so, you know, I had the same exact question, obviously, uh, and, and through this research that we've done, the first thing that we actually did, to be very, very frank here, uh, is we posed the question out to the community. You know, what are you guys seeing? What, what's currently going on right now uh, to address this skills gap? And from all the, the community source responses that we've gotten, we kind of bucketed it and, you know, grouped them into two, com two trends, two main categories that we've seen a, you know, to address this skills gap problem. The first way that we heard from, from uh, companies to address the skills gap was one, just making sure that teams internally are innovating the way that we value our existing skilled workers. So it's this premise of, you know, let's make sure that we show value. We cherish the folks that are already in this position to prevent them from wanting to move out of the industry. And so this was a, a quote that we took from Bob Latino, who's actually a great friend of mine. And um, he basically asked us and implored us to start thinking more deeply about the value of intellectual capital. And the premise behind intellectual capital is essentially like, let's value the existing people that we have on the team today. You know, when we when we lose a person, it's not just about, you know, that payroll. It's not just about, you know, whatever salary that they're on today. It's also about the years and decades of experience that's very, very difficult to quantify um, based off of all the experiences that they've had um, in what we call this, this tribal knowledge. But I think Bob actually puts it in a better, better sense. Uh, he, he calls it uh, intellectual capital. And I think that's a great, great way to view addressing this skills gap. And what he said was basically, you know, in order for us to mitigate this skills gap from ever happening in the first place, the first thing that we actually need to do is preserve the knowledge and experience of our existing employees. And it's way easier. And there've been numerous studies that say it's way easier to retain a great employee than it is to recruit, hire, train, onboard a brand new employee. The cost, once you add up all everything to, again, recruit, the time that you're losing, that, that it takes you to recruit, train, onboard, and implement a new employee, you're losing thousands of dollars 
um, just per employee. People forget that. It's a lot easier to um, retain existing employees. Uh, and, and this is one step that we've kind of seen um, from the community when we ask this question to prevent this, this skills gap from even happening. And I've already seen this from, from David here is that, you know, one, we, we actually have to, we have to invest in our existing employees. We have to train and invest in human capital. Um, and what's amazing about that is that the existing technology, you know, being released today, you know, is actually great for that. And technology is a great way to capture all of this intellectual capital while, you know, professionals, workers are still working. And it seems like a foreign, uh, and, and often it might seem foreign to many people, but what we realize is, again, like once you take a step back, you realize the impact that it, that it has when someone leaves the business becomes much more costly um, to do that versus um, try to retain existing talent. Now, the second theme that we noticed from the community was that Externally, organizations are kind of evolving the way that they partner with organizations. I saw this in the comments already here, but it sounds like a lot of people are already working on that train. You know, it sounds like a lot of companies um, are, are starting to partner more with, you know, trade schools, with colleges, with community colleges to better partner with educational resources. Um, but I would also say that not enough are. And so again, we, we pose this question out to the community. Um, Scott, um, Scott uh, who, who used to work at Nissan, uh, gave us this great quote that, that I wanna highlight here. And he basically said, you know, Nissan went from being unable to fill 75% of their job openings to filling 90% of them through a local tech program. And it was really cool to, to hear that. Again, this is the, kind of like the second train of thought to address this skills gap you know, partner with local tech programs, start at education, start at the educational level, get people really excited. And what he was saying to us was that 90% of their um, jobs, they were able to fill through this local tech program. And it was essentially, you know, the, the beginnings of an apprenticeship program. I think that's, that's amazing, amazing success from, you know, obviously starting up at, at the, the local tech programs. And ultimately, if, we, if, if more and more companies start to do this, obviously I can, see, I can start seeing where uh, technical programs grow from the support of businesses. And you know, education is not just a you know, you know, go to college, go to a four year university, but you actually see uh, businesses financially motivated to actually push farther in, at the educational level. And obviously, like, I'm really excited by this because, you know, if these programs do choose to do that, you know, I believe it's going to give more opportunities for aspiring technical professionals to acquire advanced training and find really awesome job opportunities that I believe are here within the maintenance reliability space. You know, obviously, they're, I've got a very unique and biased uh, output here, or view, look at the world with regards to the skills gap. I don't see it as a problem. I see this skills gap as a place for growth, innovation, collaboration, and a ton of opportunity. You know, whenever we, we, we don't say we have problems, we say that there are big opportunities here. And this skills gap is one that I'm actually very excited by. You've got the intersection of new people entering the workforce. You've got this intersection of technology becoming a breeding ground um, for brand new innovation and growth. And, um, you know, if we start partnering with our existing team here, you know, within the existing team that you already have, and you partner with educational resources like colleges and tech programs, I think that's an amazing place to be in. So again, I'm gonna bring this all back to what's, what's the purpose of today? Uh, you know, obviously it's this, to set a call, call out, uh, set action. What I'm gonna say here is, you know, obviously we, we need your help. As a member of the community to make all of this happen, to address this skills gap, to make sure that the folks that are retiring, we're replacing them. We're replacing this workforce with equally skilled members that want to join and that are really excited about this workforce. 
I'm going to close it out with a few final thoughts, and then I would love to open it up for open discussion. You know, we've talked a lot about like, you know, the, the, pro the problem, what we believe the solution is. So the next question is, you know, what do we do now? And what do we do now? We got to get started. Uh, obviously, you know, I kind of opened this entire presentation up with, uh, you know, the world of maintenance and reliability is unforgiving and often chaotic, often uh, reactive. But I would love to describe this field uh, as adventurous, opportunistic, filled with tons of opportunity. Um, we, we wouldn't have the infrastructure we have today if it weren't for the world of maintenance reliability. What we say is that the field of maintenance reliability supports, sustain the world that we live in today. Um, we know that the world is built off of the backs of what we consider the unsung heroes who serve in these sectors. What we often hear and, and see is that maintenance is not, maintenance reliability is not called until something bad happens. And we want to change that narrative. Um, we want to showcase the amazing work that people here in this space do before it ever turns down, turns out into a breakdown. Um, what we what we know for a fact is that maintenance reliability, though we only really hear about them until something when something goes wrong, um, maintenance reliability is done in every single building, every single industry, every single country in the world. And, and this field and all of us here in this this call today, you know, are the ones helping support, sustain, and and run the the infrastructure that the world is built on. So again, you know, I'm sure I don't have to tell everyone here, but I want to make sure that we continue to support the unsung heroes, develop these educational programs for the younger generation. I love this idea of creating apprenticeships for people who are just entering the workforce. And ultimately, at the highest level, I think what we need to do to help address this skills gap is really elevate this industry as a whole. And we do that by you know, the two things above, getting people really excited about it, showcasing the amazing work that we do, that, that you guys do on a daily basis. All right. And if we do that, then I think we can address this skills gap problem. All right. Enough of my thoughts. I'm already at, a, you know, my 30 minute mark. Um, I want to pose this question to everyone here and then we'd love to wrap it up. I really appreciate everyone you know, joining this conversation, joining this call on a really important Tuesday night. Um, so I want to ask everyone here, what do you think as a member of the maintenance community? Um, and so this is where we'll transition over into the open discussion. If you have to run, I really appreciate you taking the time to learn more about the skills gap and what we're doing about it. But for right now, I want to hear from everyone. What do you believe we must do to bridge this skills gap? Um, and I'm already getting a lot of awesome, awesome uh, responses here. Uh, you know, everything from creating ISO standards, curriculums for college and K through 12. Um, you know, the transfer of knowledge, huge, huge, huge. Um, I love it. Yeah, removing the stigma from manufacturing jobs. I completely agree. You know. I, uh, yeah, I think that manufacturing jobs, you know, are for, for whatever reason, um, you know, stigmatized to a negative degree. And I don't think people truly understand, like, how much technology there actually is in a manufacturing plant. I think, tech, you know, manufacturing typically gets a, a uh, you know, this, this bad rep around, um, you know, being non-tech savvy. But... I think that's completely false. Um, you step foot into a main facility, this whole idea of IoT is not new. It's been around for decades in the form of SCADA systems, PLCs. This is some of the most complex uh, technology that I think, you know, if we elevate that, it'll get people really excited about joining this workforce. Machine learning, robotics, these are all things that are huge. Um, I, I'm seeing such good discussion here 
And I want to make sure that we continue this conversation. It's such an important topic, uh, especially as we think about the next generation of people entering this workforce. And we kind of see and are, recognize the skills that gap that already exists today. So I'm going to close it out here and just say thank you, everyone for joining today's webinar. Thank you for everyone for all of the amazing, amazing feedback that you've given me, given us here in this chat session. Um, you know, I want you guys to all connect with me on LinkedIn. You can also shoot me uh, an email at ryan at onupkeep.com. Um, I love it. Yeah, I mean, even the small things, Joe, from, you know, the flashy, cool technologies. I agree, that's important. <laughs> all right. And with all that being said, I'm going to pass it back to Caitlin to uh, wrap it all up here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan, for that presentation and for all of our um, participants that shared such great ideas in the chat. We're going to go ahead and start a channel dedicated to Skills Gap um, to keep the conversation going. So what I'm going to do is copy and paste all these ideas and comments into that channel and then we can really start ideating because I think it's important that we're all aligning. I see a lot of people um, jumping off each other's ideas, but we should figure out how we're gonna put action to these ideas and be ahead of all of this change. So we're go gonna go ahead and make that channel, paste all these in and then start figuring out what we can do about it. So thank you all. Uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day and talk soon. All right. Thanks everyone, really appreciate it.